interrupt this, but uh, we have been allowed to stay a little longer, so please, with all the speakers come up on the table here, if we're going to have a discussion, we have to release all the pressure that you may have of questions that you want to get rid of. So please, with all the speakers of this afternoon, please come forward. Well, thank you once again to all of the speakers for sharing a whole range of difficult uh, and different uh, um, problems, problematics, uh, research, different types of auxiliary supports. Uh, please shoot. It's now you have the opportunity. There's one speaker, one question down here at the front row, Simon. You may, but we would like to, uh, to have the, uh, the mics going in because we are recording the questions. So please of tell course. your name. and uh, uh, Simon Boback, and a question for, for Jonathan. Um, he was talking about take, taking the uh, violin apart uh, with the animal glue. I'd be very interested to know what methods he uses to do that because on occasions we have mismatched joints and it is always a problem. You're dealing with something which is much more fragile generally than yeah. ours. I'd like to know your methods of taking the, jo the joints apart? Well, it's... Uh, it, it's a, it, well, we're assuming it's animal glue, and, uh, and b basically what, uh, we, what we do is... Can you move to the oh, microphone? sorry. Yeah. Basically, what, uh, the, the method that we use, and in fact, I did have a slide there, and um, I, I, I skipped through it because I, I was in a stride somewhere <laughs> else, you know. Um, <laughs> Uh, and basically, it was a little uh, make a little poultice and uh, a little um, length of cotton or linen, and, and basically the uh, y you get control of the flow of uh, moisture. I mean, you can either fill that little cup up full, or usually it's just a little bit. And you, you, it's just basically what you're trying to do is dampness on that area, and also damp a little dampness on the inside. And eventually, that that, that makes the glue. Um, or well, hopefully that may, I mean that's that, that makes the glue uh, uh, able to be taken apart, and then you can wash it out. What, what, once that glue line opens, you know you, you can you can introduce a little a uh, little more moisture. But we try. What I wanted to say um, in my uh, talk, which I'll say now, is a lot of damage is usually is caused by introducing too much moisture, not letting things uh, dry out properly, being too uh, um, w wanting to glue jo uh, joints uh, back as soon as they're uh, as, as soon as they're apart, in which case you've got tensions in the wood um, mm -hmm. from from that moisture. Letting it, uh, letting the moisture leave, you allow the wood to come back to its own equilibrium, and then you can and then you can start uh, start working again. I, Jonathan, some, sometimes we'll um, in opening a joint. Sometimes we, we might find it uh, useful to do it dry because it's more brittle. Yeah, and it's easy. It's easier for it to give up rather than introducing any moisture. Yeah. Do, you, do you have that same? Yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, that's that's basically it. But uh, but rather than just, you know, you need to you need to get uh, need to get it started. Started, um, yeah. Basically, the, um, the the way we take off a top, we usually you, you do it dry. You don't you don't um, introduce any moisture at all. Yeah. It's just done dry. But using, uh, we, we very carefully put on alcohol, uh, yeah. and uh, it'll it, it sort of dries the joint and makes it very brittle. Um, but yeah, it's probably was that answering your question? Yes, thank you. Very sure. Probably doing it. Well. There's a no, I mean, I number of questions. Know, There's one up here to the to the right in the auditorium. Thank you, Suzanne Friend, conservator in private practice. I wondered, I guess this question is primarily for Monica, but also any of the other speakers who talked about um, flexible systems for very thin panels. With, uh, with paintings on canvas that are stretched over stretchers or strainers, you often see a different crack structure that develops over the wood, or a, a crack that develops right along the inside edge of the stretcher bar. And I wondered if you've had enough time with developing these systems, if you've observed any cracks that correspond to this type of um, 
changes in relative humidity where you have the very thin panel adjacent to your structure that you've added to it. And if you've considered adding an impervious barrier to the entire panel in between the strainer system that's surrounding the panel. You mean cracks immediate around the strainer? In the, in the, As you in the paint, in the paint. Normally, I mean, I have not seen a transfer onto a panel. I mean, the panel is thin, but it's still not as thin as you would with the canvas. I mean, you do see transfer onto the panel with cradles, as I think we've seen many examples today, that, you are, that, does, that does transfer onto the front. However, just the strainer, I mean, the strainer is just sitting on there. And usually, I mean, I, I imagine you're talking about there being a difference in um, it, that, that there's, there is no moisture barrier in one, one part of the... Yeah, because you have differential reaction where the painting is... I, you know, I have put a moisture barrier usually. Sometimes I do put a moisture barrier on, on the panel, seal it with B72 at times, and then put the strainer on. However, I don't think that the strainer just sitting on there would be enough. I don't know. I mean, probably George can answer that better than I can, but I've never seen that. There was a question up there at the back, please. Uh, Debbie Orman, the Wachoch Museum. I have a question for George um, concerning uh, his springs. Um, I'm very curious to know what criteria you use to actually choose your spring, because if you get that wrong, it would strike me that it would be quite um, a retaining device rather than it being a, a flexible design device. So I'm just wondering, in actually choosing the springs that you use, what criteria do you use for individual panels? Well, uh, at this point, I mean, I think that it's uh, large, largely empirical, based on uh, based on overall thickness, uh, integrity of the uh, of the wood structure, flexibility by, uh, by touch. These are factors that come into play in deciding how much uh, recall to you know how much pretension. To set against there. However, uh, it's it's uh, maybe s slightly less uh, critical than you than you may think, in, just because of the fact that that recall. Uh, I mean, already you're making a structure that that fits the curvature uh, rather well, so that uh, a slight a slight amount more or less of pretension. Uh, doesn't change doesn't change the overall curvature at all. It may it, it may uh, offer slightly more or less resistance to uh, further deformation, but in its in its dormant state, it doesn't it doesn't change that. And in a stable environment, there, there's a greater latitude there. Um, I I mean that's that's something that I think is uh, you know it's certainly one of the questions that we need to. Uh, try to quantify more precisely, but uh, at this point, I think that it's largely a accumulated understanding of original structures that have intact cross pieces and have and uh, the whole history of things that you have have treated and understood of the kind of um, movement that you want to allow there. And that is, there seems to me that there's a that there's a uh, there's a kind of fundamental. Uh, difference between uh, uh, approach there traditionally in the south than from the north uh, in Europe in that uh, I think that with it, that in Italy it would tend to want to uh, have a higher level of restraint because uh, every original structure that has ever been devised w did include um, fairly active uh, restraint, a fair amount of active restraint. And I think that in the north, the tendency is, is more to leave, the, uh, to leave the, the panels much freer to make any movement that they want to. That in Italy, it's felt that that would lead to 
uh, quicker, uh, faster deformation of the of the panel. But and they used much thicker wood. Yes, oh, no. they have yeah. they have generally much thicker panel. But different softwood compared to the thinner oak woods yeah. of the north. Are there any more questions here? We we had a number of there's one up here. Had a number of talks about adhesives and fillers that. Uh, Dwayne Chartier, this is for uh, Ingrid. Um, you had shown uh, sensors, um, sensor traces when you moved your painting from horizontal to vertical, and all of them tracked each other very well, but there seemed to be one sensor, I think number 13, that showed a big deflection. Was that a faulty sensor, or was that actually part of your panel moving differentially in the horizontal vertical movement? <laughs> Can you repeat? The last <laughs> <thing>? <laughs> well, you, you showed us sensor traces uh, when you moved your panel from horizontal to vertical. Yes. All your sensors showed about the same deflection, except one showed a very large deflection when you moved it horizontal. Was that a faulty from sensor? From the graphs. From the graphs. Yes. Yes. Um, one showed more. Uh, um, much more deflection. Ref deflections. Um, the, um, it belongs to the position where it was. I cannot. Uh, I need the graph to can explain in detail. But um, um, it uh, maybe I had more. I put more strands on this part. Therefore, it's another way of reflection of the in in the graph. Yeah, because there's one sensor that's showing a lot of movement. Um, the other thing I was going to... Were you implying with the vibrational sensitivity of your strain gauges that yes. you can use them for other things like security measures? Yes, certainly I can use this. Is that being done actively or is that planned? Well, uh, you have a built-in security system here with very sensitive strain gauges. Yes. Is the museum using that as a security uh, so, system? Uh, the museum using that? No, no. It is... Um... Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's one case. It's the case. It's just, just a case study. Case study. Yeah. And uh, we try to find... A new version of uh, of um, measuring this movement and also to build a data logger in, in the future. Maybe there's a commercial. It's a financial uh, problem now, but we have new ideas about these uh, measurements. Um. Maybe be, before we run to that question, can I, I just want to mention something to, about Christina's talk uh, relative to the product, the 1253 uh, Aerodite, that um, I've uh, found uh, that the composition of this resin is totally different in every country. Uh, that that uh, it's considerably different. The consistency, even the percentage of um, uh, of a hardener to resin uh, that you have to mix in, the consistency of those components. In in some countries, it's a it's a it's a dark green gel as a uh, as a as a hardener and, and a crumbly uh, resin. Uh, and 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 I found that of all of the. Um, uh, the consistencies that I've seen, and, and it has effect not only on its mixing properties, but also on its spreadability, etc. And even in the finished product, its carvability and so, and and even adhesive properties, that it, it varies from country to country. And uh, of all of them, f fortunately for me, the one produced in America is by far the easiest to use, and the uh, and the uh, and the. The, you know the, the two components that are one to one. It comes out the the, the softest, mo uh, silkiest, butter-like material, and it's just fabulous. You know, and I think the UK version is quite similar to yours, uh -huh. but it, 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 there probably still some difference. Mm -hmm. But okay. but we found that with all those products, that uh -huh. the, between a year, like the resin W, they change formulations. The biggest problem we face yeah. in testing is the formulations are changing 
without yeah. you finding out. And, and this is going to be true of any of yeah. these chemical products. I mean, I even knew that uh, I contacted once a, a 3M company in, in, in America mm -hmm. to try to get a, a, just an adhesive tape that I had used in another country. And they said, oh, no, that's not, a, that's not available there because in, uh, in England it's formulated differently because there's a higher relative humidity average in that country, so we make the adhesive on the tape different for that country. So it, it's, they tailor those quite differently. Yeah. There was a question up there first, and then... Uh, yeah, is there a mic down here in the front? Yeah, there is just a comment here in the front to the discussion we are having right now. And then we're coming back to you. study to see how the resin deteriorates. Thanks. Initially, we did have some difficulty getting hold of the... Um, the the same uh, carbon epoxy that George used. Um, Is the mic on? Oh, sorry, I can see people cannot hear you. Yes. Right, sorry. Oh, OK. Uh, yeah, initially, uh, George brought me over some samples very kindly, and uh, I then got onto the manufacturers of Vantico, whoever they were, and we got a European equivalent, which I found to be different. Uh, th I then got on to um, Conservation Resources to see if they could import, uh, which they eventually did. Yeah. They, they had some problems, you know, it had to be repackaged yes. to get it into the country. Right, but because shipping, they, they couldn't ship the, the uh, hardener. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I mean, that was what uh, Christine has been using, so we, we are we are using an, an equivalent material. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Although in uh, I think in the very first uh, sort of test we did, uh, all we had available was the European equivalent. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Because I, I know the one that's available in Italy, um, when they mix the two components, it, it's nowhere near as spreadable. Uh, you know, you have a real hard time spreading it into a very thin film. Uh, the, the version that, that that they can get there. So. Right, but I mean that is available in England. If uh, you know, if anybody needs it. <laughs> there was a question up at the back, but just adding that the web resource that the Getty is uh, complementing this project with could be a wonderful place to share knowledge <coughs> about where to get the products that we're all talking about. We refer to it in articles, but they are not uh, comparable in the different countries. That's well known in conservation. This is my seventh attempt, I guess, to ask. Now I think, should I ask or not? Um, my name is Elena King, and first of all, I would like to say thank you so much for a wonderful, wonderful talk. Every single talk is like a jewel. I feel like I have a jewelry box now with all these treasures. Um, all this um, interesting information about filling materials and um, uh, inserts. Uh, but what about the panel itself? Uh, let's say uh, it's eaten by worm uh, evenly or I unevenly. Like now I have a panel which the bottom is has like way much fewer worm holes versus the top. I guess it was juicy. It has tremendous amount of worm holes and channels. So should we um, stabilize the panel itself? Should we or, or should not? And what to use to... Uh, what kind of uh, material we should use to stabilize the uh, the panel itself? Well, that's a that's a, a very complicated uh, question, and uh, you know I think you would have to examine the specific case. But in in general, I mean I can just speak for myself, really. But for myself, I would uh, tend to avoid uh, impregnation for consolidating a, a wood substance. Um, if at all possible, I mean, you have to think of uh, the, the the need. It doesn't have to. Uh, what forces does it have to withstand? It only has to support the paint film. It's okay for something to be very fragile. Then you'd be careful of it, and so you don't have to turn it into a, uh, a you know something that changes the nature of the wood substance. Uh, uh, you know, uh, it, so in some cases, say di di very dilute. The concentrations of B72 or something like that could be uh, used to stabilize an area that's very, very fragile around the perimeter, but uh, I personally would tend to avoid that kind of thing uh, as much as possible. 
what if, uh, let's say, I decided to, uh, to do an insert and I have old aged wood, but uh, the area around is eaten by worm and wicker, so if I uh, adhered it, uh, so I will probably transfer the uh, stress further where the wood is weaker. So what to do in this case? Well, I think I'll easily get out of that by saying we have to see the specific <laughs> case. Mm-hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Was there a question up at the back row? I thought I saw a hand. And to you. <laughs> well, there was no hand up there. Uh, may I ask May I ask a question? You may. I find it very interesting that... Uh, in. I don't know if it applies to, to all panel conservators, but certainly the people who spoke today all use uh, modern uh, glues. And, and um, I find it reassuring that Jonathan said that in violin restoration they, they prefer animal glue, and I think most furniture conservators would also use prefer animal glue. And, and, and what would be the reason that in panel conservation you would use synthetic Glues and resins. Uh, and res- well, Paul. F- first of all, we do use uh, fish glue, codfish glue c- quite frequently mm-hmm. I- uh, if there's a very good fit and so on. Yeah. But uh, sometimes uh, you may av- want to avoid an aqueous uh, solution just because of the absorption into a, a very fragile area close to the paint film that will swell the ground or something. You want to uh, use maybe a non-aqueous uh, adhesive, but. Whenever there's a decent fit, uh, sure, uh, codfish glue or, or organic glue, uh, absolutely. Okay. Hi, my name is Amber Kerr Allison. I'm a fellow at the Lunder Conservation Center. And I was curious about um, this is addressed to anyone at the panel, but we have some Thomas Doings in our collection that are panel paintings which, when doing purchase them, they were commercially prepared with cradles on them, but the cradles are posing some problems. And my question was, from a methodology, how do you handle something that is original that was put there, but that was part of what the artist purchased? Um, how would you, how would you treat that kind of a panel, or have you ever done that kind of a treatment? Actually, I um, I came across a very similar <coughs> issue with the Thomas doing that um, it had a cradle, a mahogany cradle on it, that I first believed for it that it was original to the painting because I do know that he did, um, it, he did work on some panels that were, uh, that were cradled originally. However, I did more research on that, and I realized that most of those cradles, although they were applied... During his lifetime, they were applied after he had painted them. And um, actually, I can't remember the name of the one, but she, uh, she, uh, I can think of the name and tell you later, but she did research onto the, uh, uh, this woman did research uh, of these cradles, and there's a group of, actually, Joyce would Susan know Hobbs? about this. Hmm? Yes. Susan Hobbs? Yes. And, um, when I spoke with her, we confirmed that most of these cradles were actually added after the paintings were painted. And I uh, decided to take off the cradle because it was causing many problems to the paint layer. I think, I don't know if you're coming across just overall pinpoint flaking throughout. And I think that's a very common problem. And uh, I think this whole series of paintings that he did, uh, that were cradled, they're all exactly the same size. I can't remember the exact dimensions, but it's a group that they're all exactly the same size, and they were just all blanket treated. It was a blanket treatment of all of them. So. But still speaking to the... Still speaking to the question, though, without that particular artist, then, have you ever come across an instance where an artist has used... A panel that came cradled, and there was the the challenge of making a decision in your treatment of retaining information that was original to the preparation of a panel. Well, that's what I thought originally, and then I realized that no, it was not original, and no, I have never come across one that was cradled before. I mean, I don't know if anybody else has, but I have not. Thank you. There is a question. Zero wants to put a question down here in the first row. Okay. 
Josh will translate. Beh, scusate, io non parlo insomma l'inglese. La domanda era per il professore di Amsterdam. L'argomento l'ho trovato molto interessante perché direi anche attuale. Di fronte a quei problemi di eh, sconnessione causata dalla costruzione, in linea generale, ci avete una linea di intervento, non intervenite, eh, ci sono dei casi appunto come avete fatto vedere il pannello siete in grado di intervenire, ma dove c'è una struttura contrapposta come l'opera che ha fatto vedere del Beato Angelico, pensi, cosa farebbe? Grazie. Uh, so Paul, did you get that? Not quite. Uh, a little bit. Uh, okay, so he, he's wanting to know, I mean, uh, for example, you, you, you mentioned the similarity between the, some, uh, the, the, the construction similarities, say, between the, between the Angelico and, 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 um, and the panel doors. And uh, uh, he also uh, mentions then the, 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 the hollow core one that yes. you took yep. apart and so on yep. and these various things. There you had the ability to uh, intervene. But what would you do in the case of something like the Angelico that has a, uh, a, a glued and nailed structure but that has a maybe a split that is m several millimeters wide uh, on the surface but you have an intact structure on the back? Would you attempt disassembly and reassembly or no? No. 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 Now, uh, we reassembled uh, that door with the Mark tree because uh, it was constructed in such a way that it was possible to remove the boards without doing damage. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Dice che solo in quel caso che era un tamburato che uh, era possibile mh, smontare montare senza causare danni. A, cioè, però in altre situazioni lo, lo lascerebbe stare come l'angelo. Ok, noi poi si è intervenuto comunque. In fact, I mean, there are many... Smontare, sì, è ovvio. Ah, so, uh, noi nel, nel tabernacolo dei lignaioli sì, sì. abbiamo chiuso quelle fessure con la con, balsa. Ah, con balsa. In, in, the, in the case of the Angelico, they actually did do a treatment, but they, they didn't take it apart. They left that together, but the open split, they, they uh, filled with a, a balsa. Yeah, so yeah. that a uh, crushable material. Yeah, that's what I would do. I mean, with the doors, uh, the cracks are are not not uh, aesthetically disturbing, disturbing. but uh, but otherwise, uh, <coughs> I would fill them. Thank you. Yeah. Ci avrei un'altra domanda rapidissima per la dottoressa del Vienna. Okay. Con le con quelli stringhetti, cosa cosa misuravate cosa cercavate di misurare with the, with the strain la commettitura gauges, yeah. the strain gauges what, what were you wanting to what was the result or what result were you looking for in the measurement uh, that that was the, the information you were getting the data you were getting from the strain gauges mm -hmm. what do you think that it By did, um, to control the movement uh, during uh, change uh, climate change I want to you wanted to measure expansion and contraction the reaction of the painting when the climate changes and dice escursione termica cioè di cambiamenti di umidità relativo movimenti eh, ma sono della quelli materia. da metallo o sono per legno are they strain gauges that were specifically developed for uh, to measure wood movement or are they ones that are, are you know, there's another type that is for uh, metal measuring metal you can also measure in metal. Mm. It's, uh, the addition is uh, so that uh, the perpendicular movement you can measure. And um, yes, and so that you know about uh, reaction, if there is a difference in humidity of 10%. So is it, is it measuring, uh, yes. Yes, is, is it measuring uh, lateral expansion and contraction or is it measuring convex flux? Convex. Convex. Cioè, so, solo, cioè, misurava solo nella direzione cioè, dell'imbarcamento e non la dilatazione in questo caso. Ok, I, grazie. I, I designed this measurement because you see millimeters and not hundreds of millimeters. millimeters <laughs> and you, you know, mm. can also measure if the the auxiliary support is stable enough when it is transported, uh, uh, transported on an easel or a, if there is a vibra vibration happening during transportation and uh, also to know more about the panel. Okay. Thank you very much.
by closing this session now, we have gone over time and we have to close now and get uh, out of this building. Uh, but by doing so, I want to thank the speakers once again. And I do hope that... And I do hope that all the wonderful images with the text to it will once be available because written articles with just a few illustrations does not really do justice to all the wonderful things that you are able to show. Thank you again. <laughs>